Anyone who follows the international sport of rugby will likely be aware of the chilling challenge put forth by the New Zealand All Blacks. At the beginning of every single game, they perform a choreographed routine called a haka. Now a haka is a Maori ancestral war cry or challenge used to intimidate their opponents into feeling they're already defeated before the game even begins. The participants stare down their opponents, shout with angry faces, jump forwards and backwards, wagging their tongues, all in an attempt to put fear into their competitors. Now, although in this case it's performed mostly for entertainment, the concept of sports intimidation is nothing new. Anyone who's ever witnessed a boxing match will have observed how the two opponents get in each other's faces with stares and sneers meant to put fear into their competitor. It's a known fact that if you feel defeated, you'll more than likely be defeated. Even sports psychologists consult with major teams on how to think winning rather than losing and how not to let intimidation influence their determination to win. Well, since we all know that fear can debilitate and rob us of that resolve or determination, then what can the power of faith do? Certainly the intimidation factor is not at all new in the world of pre-combat, but what could happen if human beings became adept at channeling the power of belief? To hear a couple of historic examples, why not stay tuned as international speaker Doug Batchelor presents the subject, Giant Faith. Tonight in our presentation of Heroes of Faith, we're going to be talking about Giant Faith. Have you ever come to a precipice in your life where you need to make a decision, you're at a threshold and you had to decide, am I really going to take the leap? Am I going to really make that decision? And you knew that your whole future rested on what you decided at that point. A few years ago, a friend invited uh, me and uh, our son Daniel to go up and try hang gliding. This friend said, uh, there's some hills up in Northern California and I've got some hang gliders. Come on, you, you and Daniel, come on up and I'll let Daniel jump off some of the little bunny hills. And he said, no, you, you and I, we can jump off a cliff. I said, sure. Sounds good. And so he took us up around the hills and a few times we jumped off and successfully landed some just some gently sloping hills where you're temporarily airborne, but the ground never leaves very far from your feet. He said, hey, you guys, you're naturals. He said, Doug, you know, you're a pilot. You can, yeah, I think you can do it. Let's go up to the hill there. I said, okay. He took us up to a high hill and he brought me to a precipice and I put this hang glider, you know, mounted on my back and you're strapped in with a harness and you're hanging from the frame and you have these two big wings going out on the side and it's got a little ribbon coming off the aluminum strut so he could see when the wind was right and he said, all right, just put, you'll get it. He was so confident. And finally, I, I got up to the edge and uh, the breeze was right. He said, this is perfect. Go ahead. I said, what do you mean? Just, he said, you're good. Jump. jump. I said, it's like, like, he said, yeah. And I'm looking down, you know, all your life, you learn about gravity to avoid, like jumping off cliffs. <laughs> and there's guardrails everywhere. And here I am. And he's telling me to do something that instinctively you're thinking, and you know, the wings are above you. You don't see them. All you see is ground below you. And you're supposed to just leap. And I, I'll admit that I stood there quivering for a while. <laughs> and I had to decide. He said, look, he finally said, it's not, conditions are not going to get any better. You just get to decide if you want to do it. And I thought, you know, if I don't do it, the rest of my life, I'm going to regret it. And my son is watching. <laughs> and what will that tell him? So I said, well, at least if I try. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I was scared. Do you ever get where like you're on the border of panic? And I had to decide, am I really going to take the plunge? And I pushed off. And for a moment, I could feel myself falling as you normally were. But then the wings caught the wind and I began to go up. And just as I'm going up, I heard him turn and say to Daniel, he said, you know, I never did tell him what to do when he gets to 18,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, in the Christian life, it really is stepping off and deciding I am going to put my whole life in God's hands no matter what the consequences are. I am going to trust Him and His Word and His promises to hold me up. The devil will do everything he can to frighten you 
from taking that step and saying, you'll kill yourself. Are you crazy? Don't do it. And you have to decide, has God given me evidence on which to base my faith? I'd like to direct your attention to the book of Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to talk about a few heroes of faith. Numbers chapter 13. And just to give you the background, the children of Israel, they've come out of Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments, they built the tabernacle, then they came up to the borders of the Promised Land. It was never God's plan that they wander 40 years. He was going to bring them in that year. They get to the border of the Promised Land and they started getting nervous. And they said to one another, you know, none of our relatives have been here in generations. We don't know what to expect. It would probably be a good idea to send a reconnaissance team, send some spies, check things out. I mean, let's find out what's really going on before we just go barging off into this land we haven't been to for hundreds of years. And so at their suggestion and pleading, God agreed and told Moses, go ahead, pick out 12 men that will serve as, they call them spies. Go to verse 17. So Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said, go up this way through the south, go to the mountains, see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether their cities that they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, meaning fertile or sparse, whether there are forests or not, be of good courage. He's saying, don't be discouraged. Be of good courage. And bring some of the fruit of the land. Why were they to bring some of the fruit? To encourage the people who had been eating nothing but manna for 40 years. This is what you've got to look forward to. Press on. They went up through the south and they came to Hebron. Hebron, that's near Jerusalem. Ahiam, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak were there. Anak was a very famous giant king. And the descendants of Anak were there. Verse 23, then they came to the valley of Eshkol and they cut down a branch of grapes with one cluster that they carried between the two of them on a pole. Now, when it takes two men to carry one cluster of grapes, that either means one cluster has thousands of grapes in it or it has the normal number of grapes, but the grapes are extraordinarily big. I prefer to believe the latter. I went to Australia, and I don't know what kind of genetic modification they did there, but somebody brought me some grapes, and I'm telling you, they were all like plums. Seriously, they were huge. Could it be that the grapes there in the Promised Land were just enormous? You'll find out the people were enormous. When we get to heaven, that's the real land flowing with milk and honey. I'll invite you over to my house for a grape, <laughs> because then I'll give you a spoon and we'll step inside the grape. <laughs> Everything's going to be bigger and better there. You know, by the way, if you go to Israel today, the logo they use for visiting the Promised Land is a picture of two men carrying one cluster of grapes between them. So then after looking at the land for 40 days, in verse 25, they return. But you find out right away that there's a big difference between 10 of the spies and two of the spies. Out of the 12, Caleb and Joshua, they were optimistic. And as they're going through the land, 10 of the spies looked at the walls of Jericho and they said, oh, wow, will you look at the walls? How will we ever conquer a city with walls like that? That is an impenetrable fortress. And Caleb said, wow, look at the springs. Look at the dates. Look at the pomegranates. And they went up into the country of Hebron. And there they had all the descendants of the Anakim, the giants. And Caleb said, wow, look at how rich the soil is. Look at how big the vineyards are. Look at how lush the orchards are and the, the abundance of water. And Joshua, and they said, wow, I can't, I want my house here. No, I want my house here. Look at, and they were so excited. And 10 of them were saying, are you kidding? Look at those guys. How can we ever conquer people so big? And on and on it went for 40 days as they went through the land. Joshua and Caleb are taking notes and getting so excited. But 10 of them are going, oh me, oh my. How are we ever going to do this? This is impossible. Why did we ever leave Egypt? We could never conquer all these nations. And all they saw were the obstacles. Now there were obstacles. But they forgot who had been leading them this far. 
and that he would be able to lead them all the way. So when they finally get back to Moses and the rest of the congregation that had been waiting anxiously for their return and their report, Caleb and Joshua said, uh, we better outrun these guys or they're going to set the wrong tone. We want to encourage. We want to inspire. And so even though they're carrying a big cluster of grapes. I'm just, I don't know that, but I, I always picture it's Joshua and Caleb that were so excited. They carried the grapes. They probably had their pockets full of pomelos and dates and raisins and all the different fruit of the land. They probably had a cloud of fruit flies following them as they <laughs> came because they had to carry those grapes quite a ways. And they outran the other ten spies. You can see in verse 27, they came to the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land and they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us and truly it flows with milk and honey and here's the fruit. And I can see him, they're taking a grape and they're saying, heads up! And they're throwing a grape and they throw another grape and they say, here's some dates and they stick it to them and, and they're just throwing the, everyone's going, ooh, ah! And their people are so excited. But then the other ten spies caught up. Notice how quickly the conversation changes begins with flowing with fruit and honey. And then ten of them say, Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. How would we ever conquer the walls of Jericho? Well, we found out, didn't we? And it says, Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. They were still left over whole race of giants. And the Amalekites dwelt in the land to the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and there's termites and gigabytes and all these ites, and they, all they could think about was all of the problems that they were going to have in the land. And the people began to moan, and they grabbed their faces and said, Me, oh my, what are we going to do? What are we doing here? Why did we leave Egypt? And it says, you can tell that because verse 30, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, I've underlined that in my Bible. We are well able. Then you get the opposite report from the other spies. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up. So who are you going to believe? There will be people who tell you that you are not able to make it to the promised land, and then there'll be people who tell you that you are. And what you believe, Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. If you believe, all things are possible. And verse 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we've gone as spies is a land that devours the inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw there the giants, the descendants of Anak that came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so were we in their sight. So they saw us and then we looked like grasshoppers. Now just to give you an idea of what they were dealing with back then, we just so happened to have one of the giants here tonight. That's going to help us out and to help illustrate... <laughs> So we really appreciate Aaron coming. Aaron is a descendant of Anak. <laughs> now, Goliath, the Bible says, you know, people sometimes tell me I'm short. I'm not really short. I'm just concentrated. <laughs> the Bible says that Goliath was nine and a half feet. This is not even nine and a half feet. But we didn't want him going any higher for insurance concerns <laughs> than this. But now, if you're going to go against the whole nation of people that are this tall, would that make you nervous? It'd be hard to go against a nation of giants, wouldn't it? And give them a hand. I appreciate that. <laughs> I wanted to do it, but they told me I couldn't. <laughs> I still wouldn't have been tall enough. <laughs> we felt like grasshoppers in our sight. You know why they couldn't take on the giants? Because they were thinking like grasshoppers. Because they did not believe, the people that did not believe did not make it. Now Joshua and Caleb, they did not lose faith. They did believe. And if you go to Joshua, the book of Joshua chapter 14, I want to give you a follow-up. We need to fast forward 40 years now. 
Go to verse 6, Joshua 14, verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word of the Lord that he spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. Listen to the courage of Caleb. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. You know what mountain he's talking about? The mountains of Hebron, the mountains where the Anakim lived, the mountains where the giants were, because as the children of Israel crossed over and they began to conquer the different lands, everyone kind of waited for the country of the giants. They said, we're not going there right away. And Caleb said, that's some of the best country. That's why the giants took it. That's where I want to go. And he said, Joshua, let me and my clan take on the giants. I know I'm 85, but I believe we can do it because if God's with us, we'll be victorious. And right now when you go to the promised land and you look at the territory with the, the word Jew, the word Jew is different from the Hebrews and all the Israelites. Ten of the tribes got carried away. The children of Judah are the Jews. And it sort of has become a word to talk about the remnants of Israel. But because of Caleb's faith, the reason that the land of Jerusalem and Judah is in that southern territory right now is because of an old man that believed he could take on giants. Amen. And he did. So what is the giant that we need to fight? What's the battle we all have? It's the devil and sin, isn't it? The whole Bible, I told you opening night, is about sin and salvation. I'm going to go to the best giant story in the Bible right now. If you want to join me and turn to the first book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 18, or chapter 17, verse 1, the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and they were gathered at Sukkoth, which belongs to Judah, and they encamped between Sukkoth and Azekah and Ephdamon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And a shield-bearer, an armor-bearer, went before him, and he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you are the servants of Saul? Choose yourself a man and let him come down. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight. In other words, the whole battle between the two nations is going to pivot upon a man-on-man -man conflict. And he throws down the gauntlet, and he stands out there like a looming redwood tree. And day after day, they had probably little skirmishes along the creek where they were lined up. Day after day, Goliath came thundering down and all the men of Israel fled back from him. And he got more bold in his insulting the God of Israel and challenging them. Send me a man. Send me a man. And then about that time, Jesse, who had his other sons all fighting in the battle except for the youngest who was taking care of the sheep, his father sent him to bring some provisions. And when David came, the very day he came, and he's giving provisions to his brothers and to their generals, they, and, you know, they had to feed the army every day. It was quite a task. That's right when Goliath decided to march out and issue his challenge. And David, you know, they didn't have Internet. He didn't know what was going on. And he heard Goliath challenging the armies of Israel, and he was taunting, and he was mocking, and he was saying the God of Israel was weak, can't produce one soldier and the blood came up into David's face and he couldn't believe that nobody's looking around saying, who's going to take him up? How long has this been happening? 40 days now. Nobody has taken him up? Doesn't anybody believe that God can help them beat this guy? Is God with us or is God with him? They said, well, don't you see how tall he is? Who cares how tall he is? Is God with us or is God with him? Is Jesus with you? How do you know? Because he said... Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. So when temptation comes, you take your sword, 
The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And you stand back to back with Jesus and you might have to fight, but you will never lose because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Are you aware that you and God always make a majority? Isn't that right? So David, he was outraged. Finally, he makes such a ruckus. They say, you know, they tell the king, there's this young man in the camp that's talking about he'll take on the giant. The king's desperate, and I said, bring him to me. And David comes, and the king says, he sizes him up. And David may have been 18 to 20 then. I know we always picture David as a little boy. That makes for good storytelling in the younger divisions. But in reality, he was probably 18 to 20 years old. You weren't considered a man until you were 30. But he's still a stripling. He's not even filled out yet. And he said, you're going to go against him? He said, he's been a man of war since his youth, and you're just a youth. Now listen to David's answer. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, and I struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. I'm so thankful that Jesus will fight for his lambs, won't he? And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and killed it. Doesn't say he killed it with a sling. He took it with his shepherd's staff and bludgeoned the thing. And David said, I did it with a bear and I did it with a lion. And so what he's saying to Saul is the reason I have faith that I can take on the giant is based on evidence from past experience. This is how it works in the Christian life. When you start praying and God starts answering your prayers, you start taking steps of faith and say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to change this behavior. Because, you know, that's the real battle. It's character transformation. I don't know how I'm going to do this, Lord, but with your help, please help me. Please forgive me. And then we see victory. Wow. Lord, how about this? And how about this? And what's happening is all the while your faith keeps getting bigger based on past evidence. Faith is not just blindly believing. Faith is believing in the evidence that God has given you. I believe the God that helped me kill the lion and killed the bear can help me kill the giant. And so he said, let me go with what I'm used to. David walks down, leaves the army. The army of the Philistines are watching and they see Someone's coming out by themselves from the army walking directly towards the Philistine army on the other side of the hill. And they go, what's he up to? Is he bringing a message? Are they surrendering? Is he going to announce who their warrior is? And he stops at the brook and he starts to feel around in the brook in between the two hills and he picks out five stones, sticks them in his shepherd's pouch. And then he starts walking up the hill. And they realize he's come to take on Goliath's challenge. Goliath marches out to meet him. And he's, he can't believe it. Yeah, he says, when the Philistine looked about, verse 42, and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. Mercy, if he's at least ugly, but he's a cute kid. <laughs> so the Philistine says to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? He's got a shepherd's staff, and he's got a sling. And he gets so mad, he realizes what Saul's up to. It's a PR stunt. And the Philistines said to David, Come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver, deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you and this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. Everybody was looking at how big the giant was but David wasn't. He was looking at how big God was. He said, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a shield. Yeah, you have those things. He says, but I've got God with me. So it was when the Philistine arose, he came and he drew near to meet with David, that David hurried and ran towards the army to the Philistine. Now, I'm always amazed by a couple things. One is, I'm amazed at the audacity of David. You think if you're going to fight a giant, don't make him mad and insult him first, right? David didn't care. He spoke boldly. God spoke through him. And the other thing, if you're going to fight a giant, the giant is walking down to meet you, would you run to meet him? Would you run to fight a giant? David was absolutely fearless because he knew that the Lord was with him 
And he also knew from his brothers that were all soldiers there's something called the element of surprise. When Goliath saw that they had brought down a kid to fight against him, he was so outraged, maybe it was a hot day, he pushed back his helmet, because the Bible said he had a helmet on, probably his forehead had been protected, but he pushed it back. And David said, I didn't know exactly whether I was going to use my staff or use my sling, but thank you, Lord, I knew you'd provide an opening. I don't know if David knew exactly what he was going to do, but God revealed it to him at the right moment. And as he's running, he sees Goliath's got a big bullseye on his forehead. He takes a stone, and he slung that stone while running, and it hit the giant in the head. And his eyes crossed up, and he staggered, and then he fell ingloriously on his face with a big thud. And there David, in front of everybody, decapitated the giant. Just as he said, I will take your head from you today. Make sure he wasn't getting back up again. What did he use to kill him? The sword. What do we use? What did Jesus do to fight the devil in the wilderness? It is written. Friends, we're dealing with giants every day. This is not just a Bible story. The devil is, he's much bigger than we are. He's a powerful angel. And his devils, his demons, they're much more powerful than we are. We can't fight these giants. We're just grasshoppers without Christ. But through Christ, we can have giant faith. We at Amazing Facts Ministries wish to thank those of the viewers who have chosen to support this ministry with both their much needed prayers as well as their loving gifts. As a nonprofit ministry, our reach through television out into the dark and dreary world is made possible only by way of partnering support we receive from you, our viewers. If you have been blessed by this ministry, then we simply ask that you think of someone else who also may be blessed and base your financial support on reaching others who may benefit as well. To make a donation, please call our toll-free number at one 877 721-3800 or mail us at the address on the screen. Thank you for watching. Together, we have spread the gospel much farther than ever before. Thank you for your support. This is your opportunity to take advantage of this week's special offer. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make the request.